Hello, I'm Juliet Mann and this is the Agenda podcast, CGTN Europe's one-stop shop for smart, in-depth discussion of the issues that really matter in the world today. Even as India made history, landing a spacecraft on the moon's south pole, national space agencies in China, Russia, the US and at companies like Elon Musk's SpaceX are clamouring to leave Earth. But is the world ready for a new space age? Joining me now is Professor James Head from Brown University. He trains astronaut crews in geology and surface exploration and has also played a pivotal role selecting landing sites for the Apollo Moon program. Professor, it's fabulous to have you on the agenda. Um, first of all, let's start off talking about why the moon is so important in space exploration. Well, there are really two reasons. The first one is technological. It's relatively easy to get to. It's not like uh, taking months to get to Mars and a lot of uncertainty or Venus. Um, and the second one is really um, having to do with science. Uh, the moon really reveals the missing chapters of Earth history. It's absolutely incredible because, you know, we, the Earth is so dynamic and so active with plate tectonics and erosion that we don't really know um, what the first half to two-thirds of the history of the Earth really looked like. And that's all preserved in the moon and planets. So if we go study the moon, it's like a history book replacing the missing chapters of Earth history. So those are two major reasons. And why is the focus now on the lunar south pole? There's, there's really several reasons for that, too. The, the first one is that um, it's Luna incognita. You know, we really don't have a very good idea about what's going on on the far side of the moon or the polar regions of the moon. We've concentrated exploration with the Soviet exploration, with the U.S. Apollo programs and related missions, uh, the Chang'e missions, et cetera, and the, and the Chandrayaan missions uh, before this in, uh, in the near side, in the upper part of the near side of the moon. So these are areas, you know, it's like saying, gee, uh, we, we only understand half uh, of the moon, okay? Uh, that's not very good if you really want to get a global understanding of the early history. So. That's one major reason we're going to explore Terra Incognita. The two other major reasons have to do with the fact that um, Chandrayaan-1, uh, the Indian spacecraft, we had an experiment that NASA paid for, and the Indians put it on their spacecraft to go to the moon, which discovered water in the polar regions of the moon. This is really important scientifically. Water on the moon, where does that come from? Is it from outer space? Is it a record of early projectiles coming in, of comets, et cetera? Could it be coming out of the moon and preserved there? Um, and, you know, where where is it coming from? So scientifically, it's really important because when there's water on the moon, it's so, it's so hot in the day that the water goes to the polar regions into craters that are permanently shattered and is trapped there. So, hey, that's great news if you want to stay on the moon a long time because it gives you the possibility of having resources there. You know, you need water. It takes a huge amount of energy to take water to the moon. And if you already have it there, that means you can stay a long time. The third reason really is to survive lunar night. You know, uh, <laughs> day and night on the moon aren't 24 hours. They're like two weeks, okay? And so uh, you're going to be in the darkness with no solar energy on the moon for two weeks, except at the poles, because there are places there where the sun is coming in and you can actually capture it for about... 80 to 90 percent of the year so you can get solar arrays there and survive lunar night in the south pole region so those are three major reasons why there's a concentration science aside i wonder about territory i mean is there maybe a darker side to the moon's race i think that's a very fundamental question that we have to address all the time i i am hopeful based on my 50 or plus years of experience in international uh, solar system and space exploration that that won't be an issue if you look at the 16th and 17th and 18th century in our in our planet, <laughs> on our planet, you know, clearly these were times when you wanted to go plant the flag to claim the territory, okay? That was, that was all part of these scientific expeditions. They weren't just science. They were really uh, planting the flag for national claims, et cetera. Uh, you know, that's, that hasn't been so, so much in space. And if you look recently on the Earth, the Antarctica is a really good example of a way to do it peacefully. There's the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, that, that means no utilization of, uh, you know, mining or anything like that. Um, and most of the nations are signatories to that. There is a moon treaty, too. So we hope that it'll be much more like Antarctica, where, you know, I've had five field seasons in Antarctica, and it's just great. It's completely international community. 
and it's uh, really the way I hope that the moon exploration will be. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, if we discover gold on the moon, then, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. But I think the odds on that are pretty unlikely. But we still do have to pay attention to that issue. But the, the structure is there with the moon treaty, et cetera, uh, to, to deal with it. And I hope it becomes like Antarctica. So let's talk about who's in space and India's history-making mission to the moon, the Chandrayaan-3. Talk us through why it's such big news for, for India's space program, but also for beyond India, for, for, for the space community. Well, you know, as a scientist, <laughs> you know, um, we need all the help we can get. You know, one nation can't afford to do everything. Uh, space is a huge, huge final frontier. It's not final, it's the next frontier. And so, you know, any nation that can put together the capability to help explore the solar system, starting with the moon and moving out from there, is really a big contribution to science in general. So that's that's a big deal. I welcome anybody who can, and we can help them, you know, the United States and other nations can help each other uh, to develop this capability, et cetera. So that, that's a big deal. The second one is that for the country itself, it's really important. Um, you know, it's clear from the Soviet Union and the United States 50 years ago that the demonstration of space capabilities is also a demonstration of national power. It's all about national pride and prestige. Pride is how we yeah. view ourselves. It's not arrogance. It's how we view ourselves. It's like, wow, we did it. If you only have to look at the faces and the excitement of all the people in that room to realize that a 12-year-old watching that television is going to say, I want to be with them. I want to go and get educated in science and technology in India because I'm proud of my country and I want to be a part of that. So pride and prestige yeah. is how people view us from elsewhere. So it's all, you know, it's all related to this. It's just fantastic. The United States, so the, the other original um, space power, they said their stated aim is to send humans back to the moon by 2024. That's you know, only months away. How realistic is it? Well, I think <laughs> it's probably going to be late 2024, but I think it's, I think it's realistic. The, the uh, you know, one doesn't uh, send humans into space without being 100% sure uh, of the safety. And of course, uh, space is not like going down to the corner market. Um, you, you know, you, you can't be 100% sure of anything. Um, and so you have to be as sure as possible. So we spend a lot of time focused on uh, safety and, uh, you know, essentially backup systems, et cetera, et cetera. And I think uh, Artemis One was successful. The, the capsule is, is successful. Um, and I think Artemis Two, which is to send uh, an Apollo 8-like uh, uh, astronauts in an Apollo 8-like mission to the moon and back without landing, uh, is very realistic. I think, you know, everything I've seen says that the system is about, is, you know, getting ready to go by that late, late 24 uh, date. I think the more uncertain uh, date is, in fact, um, Artemis, Artemis 3, which will be the first lunar landing. And uh, because, you know, we haven't yet seen all the suits and the spacecraft, uh, landing spacecraft, et cetera, we're working very hard now on the integration of uh, all our information we have and choosing landing sites in the south circumpolar region. Uh, so all that's going along very well. But there's a lot of things that have to be finalized and integrated. Um, so I would say, you know, that's the more uncertain date. Look, China is planning missions to the lunar south pole with and um, without um, astronauts. The, their timeline is before the end of the decade. Well, what's your take on t China's space progress? I think China is doing absolutely fantastically both in human and robotic uh, exploration. They, they uh, you know, they, they have a large number. The population is huge. And so you have a, essentially a source of it, just and very bright and imaginative and creative engineers and scientists. I've spent time uh, interacting with them significantly um, in research uh, on, um, on, on the moon and Mars. Um, they've had you know, their Chang'e program, which is uh, essentially um, uh, their lunar robotic lunar program, is just going fantastically. They've had three orbiters. Uh, it's the orbiting phase. They've had landers. Uh, uh, Chang'e 3 um, landed with U-2 rover. That was very successful. Chang'e 4 landed on the far side after they put in a, essentially a uh, orbiting spacecraft for communications on the far side, uh, send it back to the Earth. Uh, that was that was has not been done before. 
Um, and that's enabled them to also do things like um, uh, essentially land a rover on the far side of the moon, which is still operating today. Chang'e 5, a return uh, robotically, return lunar samples from a very important area, and that's being shared with the international community now, those, those samples. Uh, and uh, Chang'e 6 is just scheduled to land on the far side in the very important South Pole Aiken Basin and return samples from there. And I attended a meeting uh, in April in Hefei, China, where we talked a lot about the International Lunar Research Station, the sites to go to, et cetera. And I also attended a meeting there for their um, essentially sample return mission from an asteroid. And they landed successfully with a rover on Mars the first time. So with some very interesting results, by the way. So, so they're doing extremely well. And that's just the robotic program. I think the human program uh, has, is very, very active and very productive as well. So it's all incredibly exciting, but but the cost of all this, it, it's mind boggling, isn't it? I mean, I'll just you know, give, give you one example here. The US Apollo program, which I know you're familiar with, ran over seven years and those 12 missions between 1969 and 72 cost about $25 billion. Transfer that into today's money and we're talking about $250 billion. I mean, rocket science is, is still hard. It, it doesn't get any cheaper, does it? Uh, no, it, it isn't. It's an investment. I think you have to look upon it as an investment. You know, when John Young, the Apollo 16 commander, came back from his mission to the moon, um, a, a media person asked him that very question. Is it really worth it? And he said, well, you know, we didn't leave one dollar up there on the moon. And the point is that, <laughs> you know, all that money is spent here. And what is it spent on? It's spent on science and technology development. It's spent on uh, employing imaginative engineers, uh, uh, you know, and, and scientists, et cetera. It's moving things forward fantastically. And I think there's, you know, it's an interesting point. One of my colleagues, astronaut colleagues, Mike Collins, who was a command module pilot on Apollo 11, after he came back, he became director of the National Air and Space Museum. And he told me one time that that he would stand outside. He's, he's Mr. Every Day, so people wouldn't recognize him like Neil Armstrong. Um, so he would stand at the exit to the museum and just interview people. He said, so what do you think is larger, the NASA budget or the military budget? And almost uniformly, people would say, oh, uh, NASA's budget, which NASA's budget today uh, is uh, essentially one uh, twenty-sixth that of, NASA, uh, of the military budget. So we, NASA, the military spends NASA's total budget for the year in two weeks, okay? So that's okay, you know, we have, we have these important priorities, but when you put it in those kinds of perspectives, um, you know, Mike Collins's uh, conclusion was, yeah, well, you know, I think NASA's getting too much publicity, not, not enough, <laughs> because people think, you know, we must be spending huge billions and billions of dollars more than we actually are. So I, I think it's an investment, um, it's a good investment, uh, and uh, and I think if you, it's sort of like saying, should I spend money on going to the movies or the play when, in fact, people are starving in Africa? And the answer is, you have to do both, okay? And you have to prioritize, and you know, um, it can't all be one thing. And you have to make make priorities. And I think space is a priority um, for a lot of reasons. There's also the environmental considerations too. You know, if technology is so developed here on planet Earth that, that we can see things and analyze things far better than ever before um, from down here. Do we need these expensive and potentially environmentally damaging space missions? Yeah, I think the, you know the key about environmental damage has to do with um, has to do with the uh, liftoff, essentially rocket fumes and uh, uh, essentially contrails, if you will, in uh, in uh, in Earth's Earth's environment and. I think that, that's always a concern. We're always concerned about why we're thinking about more efficient fuels, how we can launch more with, with less fuel, reusable rockets, all these kinds of things uh, uh, that, uh, that a number of uh, Elon Musk's, uh, SpaceX and others have been investigating, et cetera. All these things are very much on our minds. If you look at the data, uh, really the, the, the pollution from uh, spacecraft launches is pretty, pretty low. Uh, it's a very small percentage of anything else that we do, and we're conscientious about that. We have to think about that. We have a lot of discussions about that, and we and people are absolutely working on it. But I think if you look at the the overall cost benefit analysis, uh, and you know the attention to trying to decrease uh, these effects, uh, you you can't, you know, with all the other benefits, you know, the uh, uh, 
things, uh, things that come from the space program, the science and technology, the in inspiration of youth into uh, key careers in science, technology, and math, and et cetera. All of these things far outweigh uh, the small percentage of pollution that uh, that comes. And, and I don't think we can solve problems just from what we have here on the Earth. You know, uh, I think it was Plato who said, you know, essentially necessity is a mother of invention. So if you go into space, uh, you're getting new challenges, which are creating new problems and new necessities. And these absolutely map out into uh, applications here on Earth. Do you think that the, the, this clamour to, to explore and get to the moon is a stepping stone to further exploration, to, to Mars, say? Well, that certainly is NASA's plan. Uh, the, the, this is a, um, a forward to the moon, onto Mars. Um, I, I, I don't like the term uh, stepping stone because it implies, you know, you, you, you jump on it and then you leap off to another destination. I think most of scientists, and I think NASA as a whole, uh, are talking about a permanent presence on the moon. And, uh, and then from that, you then uh, figure out ways to live off planet and, uh, and then uh, press on to Mars. So we are actually working on a committee that will meet this coming Monday where we're talking about the scientific uh, goals of human exploration on Mars as part of a NASA uh, committee, et cetera. Uh, so um, this, this will be... Um, you know, this, this, is, this is where we're going, okay, in the final analysis, but it's really hard to get to Mars. It takes a long time. There's a lot of unproven capabilities and technologies and human, and, human elements, uh, you know, how you, uh, how you are able to work when you land on Mars subsequent to um, uh, a year or so uh, in space, et cetera. So there's a lot of unknowns, and I think the key here is if you ask any of the Apollo astronauts uh, whether the moon is a stepping stone, they say, well, actually, <laughs> the moon is going to be the geology field training area for going to Mars. That means you're going to be living there. Uh, you're going to be learning how to actually work for long periods of time off planet. And it's not a stepping stone. It's a proving ground. Plus, you want to, we only know half the moon. You know, it's, it's, it, it's just, you know, there's so much more to learn that we don't want to just step on it and jump off to Mars. We, we, we need to learn from it from a host of different points of view. You know, I'm reminded again of a comment that John Young, the Apollo 16 commander, made when he came back from the moon. <laughs> Another reporter said, um, uh, gee, um, is it really worth spending all that money going to the moon? And, and, uh, and John, he's from Georgia, a, a southern state. He had kind of a southern drawl. He said, you know, um, single planet species don't survive, which means that if we don't learn how to live off planet, you know, uh, if the big impact comes, you can ask the dinosaurs about this. You know, we may not survive as a species. So his point was kind of subtly that this kind of exploration, we need to learn to live off planet and to think really long term for the survival of the species. Professor James Head, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. China is planning to land the first Chinese astronauts or Taikonauts on the moon by the end of the decade with a view to setting up a research base there. Well, let's get some more detail on that now with Zhu Yang Song, the director for international cooperation at the China National Space Administration. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Um, how has China's progress changed, the, the, the race to space, other national space agencies, and, and something we're seeing more of, commercial organizations. Well, I think uh, the Chinese uh, National Space Administration is focusing on exploration programs in the past uh, decade or so. We had a number of missions to the moon, uh, including Chang'e missions. These series, including orbiting uh, by Chang'e 1 and 2, and landing by Chang'e 3 and 4, which the number four landing on the far side of the moon, bear in mind that we have also a, a relay satellite in the halo of it beyond the moon, and also Chang'e 5 and 6, which are now meant to be a sample return mission. And Chang'e 5 has successfully returned 1.7 plus kilos of samples, and Chang'e 6 is uh, opening for extensive international collaborations and also aimed at uh, landing on the po uh, South Pole, which is... Uh, uh, which has, more, uh, let, let's say, lunar volatiles and resources and, and water ice deposits. So we, we're focusing on the planet, um, uh, uh, planetary missions. Uh, we also have uh, 
missions to the Mars. Uh, we have uh, successfully la uh, launched and landed on the Mars surface uh, in deployment of the rover. And also we have uh, the second mission, which is uh, uh, in preparation. And we also have a longer mission, which is have a, a Mars sample return missions. And all of these will have, um, in particular, the lunar mission will have emerging with the manned mission to the lunar surface uh, in this decade. So we're looking forward to extensive uh, uh, club, uh, collaborations uh, in, in terms of uh, human and robotic missions to the moon. Let's talk a little bit more about that manned lunar mission you're, you're talking about. You know, China's ambitions in, in, in space to have a crew landing on, on the moon um, by the end of the decade. I mean, what are the technological benchmarks for that plan to be on track? Well, we have a preload program, which is called a lunar base, a scientific lunar base. Uh, this is going to be an international uh, station, uh, lunar station, for a lunar base station for uh, uh, robotic missions. And this is based on robotic uh, explorations of the lunar surface. And with that mission, we also have a preparation for the final step of uh, human missions. And of course, these two missions are running in parallel. And the manned mission is what we call a miniature uh, manned mission has been achieved by the Chang'e 5, which is a sample return mission. And that mimicked the whole process of a manned mission in a small scale. We have a launching uh, of uh, the capsule and also descending of the vehicle and also collecting of samples and also the returning of the samples to the lunar orbit and rendezvous and docking and transfer of the, uh, the samples to the orbiter and also kick that back to the, uh, to the Earth's um, orbit and also successfully recovered that sample. And that sample return mission is a, what we call a, a prelude process of the manned mission. India's Chandrayaan-3 made space history landing on the lunar South Pole, but Russia's mission um, malfunctioned. Russia's space agency, Bosto, said this is not just about the prestige of the country and the achievement of some geopolitical goals. This is about ensuring defensive capabilities and achieving technological sovereignty. Is that how China sees the new space race? Well, I think the space race is more of a, a demonstration of technology, technological uh, capabilities of each, different countries. Uh, we have noticed the uh, successful descent of the Chandrayaan-3. Uh, of course, that's based on the failure of Chandrayaan-2. Uh, we also have a, a Russian uh, uh, Luna 25, which is also malfunctioned at the last minute. Um, we know that these are uh, you know, technical hiccups that happens. And also the landing on the, far, uh, on the uh, South Pole is also very important for uh, future explorations and in situ resource uh, utilizations. Uh, the Chinese mission, uh, as I mentioned, the orbiting landing and uh, sample returns, and also future space station, uh, the lunar space station uh, construction is based on peaceful purpose. Uh, we have no military intention whatsoever in this process. And that also goes uh, to the Mars mission as well. As you know, that we have a successful uh, landing mission of the Chang Chang'e 3 and 4, and the Chang'e 4 has been landing on the far side of the moon, which is more challenging than the South Pole because you have to relay the communications and TTNC signals through a, a data relay satellites. Uh, so all of these are very challenging tasks. Um, we have uh, successfully conducted those, and the, uh, the Chinese uh, International Lunar Base will be also focusing on the South Pole uh, in search of uh, in situ resource, lun lunar volatiles and water ice deposits. Now, lunar material collected by China's moon mission is being shared with international scientists. Is that kind of cooperation and collaboration something we've seen before? Well, the collaboration has always been open. We started from the Chang'e uh, 1 and 2. As you know, we have successfully uh, orbited the lunar surface, lunar surface by Chang'e 1 and Chang'e 2 after completion of the mission has been diverted to an asteroid uh, study. And also, the Chang'e 3 uh, and Chang'e 4 missions, we also collaborate with international communities. And also, my per I'm, I'm, I've been personally in contact with, the, uh, with NASA on the data sharing of some of the uh, lunar exploration missions. And the sample, as you have mentioned, returned from the Chang'e 4 mission and the coming, uh, the Chang'e 5 mission and also coming uh, up Chang'e 6 mission will also be shared based on equal, equal 
uh, sharing and also uh, based on the scientific oriented uh, study. What other kinds of um, collaboration partnerships do you, do you see working um, in space that might make sense? Maybe a, a China Russia joint mission? Well, I think um, uh, at this moment uh, we see uh, two different levels of collaboration. One is on technological uh, capabilities and competence. Uh, for example, the launchers and the satellite technologies, the landers and the rovers, and all of these are uh, based on a very uh, sensitive uh, political uh, arena and political level uh, of different countries. Uh, and how close you're between your allies and your friends, then you can collaborate on this level. So, uh, for example, this is success, uh, successfully demonstrated by the collaboration of the International Space Station, which has involved more than 20 countries uh, participating by providing different segments and uh, fuselage and robotic arms and, uh, and uh, technical devices. And this has, is one level of collaboration, which is more sensitive. The other part is less sensitive uh, for example, for scientific-oriented uh, studies, uh, this including sample studies that you have mentioned, and also uh, joint scientific studies and joint uh, demonstration of uh, different uh, scientific uh, projects, all of this will be less sensitive. Uh, less sensitive. And also, we, have, we can also have a multilateral collaboration among different countries. With this will make also less sensitive among countries who have, um, you know, different uh, considerations of uh, different countries' uh, technical levels. So I think these two levels can, can further extend uh, cooperation in different areas, in particular in space explorations. And exploration and scientific missions are less sensitive uh, rather than, uh, you know, like uh, uh, infrastructure constructions and uh, uh, communication, navigation, and defense co collaborations. So are you saying that the, the tone and the mood of, of, of space in, in the future is going to be much more about collaboration and less of, of that Cold War rivalry that we, we had initially in the race to space between the United States and the Soviet Union? Well, I think human race, uh, in comparison with the universe, in, not to mention the solar system and also interplanetary studies, all of this involves uh, highly, um, you know, uh, classified and also highly, um, let's say, sensitive technologies. But all of these or has to be uh, involved when you have a human mission, for example, to the moon. And, and, and uh, once human is stepping out of the Earth, you're uh, being very vulner uh, vulnerable to the universe. Uh, you have no atmosphere, and you have uh, different gravities, you have radiations. All of this uh, doesn't call for competitions. This calls for cooperation, for exploration, uh, exploration of a joint mankind's uh, effort. Zhu Yang Song, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find more agenda content on CGTN Europe's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube channels. Until next time, goodbye. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.